Fantastic. So welcome everyone. I can still see a few folks dialing in, but I'm conscious of time and I want us to go ahead and get started. Um, I wanted to, first of all, recognize uh, my colleagues who I was privileged enough to work with on the COVID-19 Healthcare Coalition Telehealth Survey for joining me today. This was such a fascinating body of work. I also think it's really important, given where we are, to learn as much as we can from the Herculean effort that our clinical colleagues made to turn on a dime during the COVID crisis and deliver care remotely. As you'll see, there's an awful lot of rich information um, in this uh, study, uh, in these study findings. We'll talk through some of them today. But for folks who haven't attended one of our journal clubs before, let me just orient you really quickly, and then I'll go ahead and ask my expert colleagues to introduce themselves. So first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Jen Goldsack. I'm the Executive Director of the Digital Medicine Society, or DIME. And every month we host actually my favorite event on our regular calendar, which is Journal Club. We keep these meetings a little bit smaller. We really do encourage you guys, it's not a webinar format, it's intentionally a meeting format, to dive in and ask your questions to the experts we bring in. Um, something you should note, we are recording this. So think about that when you ask your questions, it will be posted mostly so your colleagues can benefit from it later. But uh, the way we'll run this is we will offer some brief remarks um, from the survey. Um, the study lead, um, FX Campion, is going to lead those remarks. And then we'll do a bit of a round robin. And you'll hear from this multi-stakeholder group about um, how we interpreted these findings from a different vantage point and how we intend to move forward based on our knowledge. Then we'll throw it open to questions and we welcome any and all. There's a couple of ways you can do this. Um, if you'd like to ask your question live, you can just raise your hand, um, not like this, using the, uh, the function in Zoom. Uh, and I will make sure I call on you and you can ask your question directly. If you are somewhere that you can't talk, you can type it into the chat or into the Q&A. Um, but we really encourage participation in this. This is why we keep this group a little bit smaller and I'm looking forward to a terrific conversation. So with that, welcome again, everyone on the line. And I'm gonna whiz through the list as we have it here and ask my colleagues to introduce themselves to you before we dive in with the session proper. So Laurie, would you like to go first? Sure, thanks very much. So, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Lori Prestesader. I'm a vice president with the American Medical Association, specifically in the health solutions group. And in the health solutions uh, team, we manage and curate basically the data assets for the AMA, primarily the CPT code set and physician master file data. Uh, and so I've been privileged to work with this this team on this research, um, which as you'll hear, uh, largely underpinned by the CPT code data that we were able to analyze uh, that Change Healthcare brought to the table. I've been with the AMA about three years now and uh, excited and appreciate the opportunity to have the conversation today. Meg? Great, yeah, I'm Meg Barron. I'm vice president of our digital health strategy team. Um, pleasure to see some familiar faces and some new faces on the, on the call today. Um, our team at the AMA is really focused on how do we help to improve the quality of digital health solutions and telehealth and remote patient monitoring um, included in that? Then how do we help to get scale and spread for solutions in market and solutions that are evidence-based such as telehealth? And our work is really encompassed um, largely by research. So that's why it's been such a pleasure to work on this uh, multifaceted survey with the group, um, as well as resources to really help to enable practices and physicians across the country. So pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Thanks, Laurie. Thanks, Meg. Jeff, would you like to go next? Sure, yeah. And thanks so much for inviting me, Jen. Uh, my name is Jeff McGinn. I work in the research and development slash data sciences uh, team within Change Healthcare. Uh, Change Healthcare, if you don't know, is, is a very large commercial medical claim processor. And what that gives you with respect to telemedicine is a really rich data set that enables you to look not only utilization and diagnosis, but also understand a lot of the ecosystem dynamics that are driving telemedicine change and how telemedicine continues to evolve. evolve. Um, it's been such a pleasure to work with these brilliant people on this team. Uh, I have no claims to brilliance myself, but I definitely have learned so much. And uh, I think this is uh, gonna be a, a fantastic way to learn more about telemedicine and to think about the future of care delivery and how tele uh, technology proper can kind of interface with that and drive outcomes and care process change. So again, thank you so much for your time. 
Fantastic, Jeff. That was terrific, and uh, I uh, I would argue the brilliance. And I think that the terrific thing about this team uh, that sort of came together was the diversity of expertise and resources and insights. So I'm excited for the conversation. Nick, do you want to go next? Yeah, happy to. Uh, Nick Doherty, Managing Director, Mass Challenge Health Tech. Um, really excited to be here today. I think what I'm bringing uh, to the conversation is the entrepreneurial perspective. So we we manage a program where we we match startups and uh, large organizations together to work on solving massive challenges. And of course, COVID-19 was a pretty massive challenge, is a pretty massive challenge. Um, and a number of our companies uh, were trying to sort of jump into that fight, try to uh, make some change happen in a positive way. And uh, there are certain companies that were had the ability to do so, um, and there are certain companies that, that weren't able to. And so we were able to see in real time where the boundaries were when it came to telehealth, where the barriers were, um, where the opportunities were. Um, and so this, this report's really fascinating because it tells you, um, you know, what's possible today, um, but it also illuminates some of the gaps that we can do, uh, that we can address uh, when we're manifesting that future. So excited to talk about um, what that could look like today. Fantastic. Thanks, Nick. Um, and FX will come to you next as our fearless leader. Great. So uh, yeah, why don't you, you can even go ahead and start showing the slides. I'm an internal medicine physician based here in Boston I, with a large medical group called Atrius Health. We have about 800 physicians and I uh, ad admit patients to the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, on the research side, I'm a principal lead for digital health with the MITRE Corporation. And we uh, have numerous uh, large scale projects uh, around the country, many with the federal government. Uh, but this particular project was uh, with private sector colleagues uh, who you've just met uh, in the midst of the pandemic. And so this is really exciting. I, I have the good fortune to be able to practice uh, internal medicine, both uh, with face-to-face -face and telehealth uh, increasingly and uh, get to study the implications of it on the national scale and hope to uh, impact the story around telehealth in coming months and years as we make our way forward together. Um, so the story of the impact study uh, really started with the, with the COVID pandemic and the call to arms from the COVID-19 Healthcare Coalition, which is a group of a thousand plus organizations who uh, all uh, were doing our, our, our parts on many, many different aspects of the COVID pandemic response. And telehealth was one of those, one of 15 uh, different work groups that we uh, spun up over that time. Uh, and this study, the telehealth impact study is really a group of three studies and currently continuing. One is a large claim study uh, the second is a physician survey, uh, and the third is a patient survey, which is currently in flight. So uh, hard to get our arms around all of this in our short time together today, but what I'd like to do is uh, ask you to make sure you visit the, the c19hcc.org website where you can uh, enjoy the study and interact with it because it is actually an interactive uh, web tool. So you can drill down and look at interesting subcomponents of both the claims data and the surveys. So that being said, uh, next slide, Jen. And Jen did ask us to distill it down to just two slides, but I couldn't, I couldn't hold myself back. So I think we have four. <laughs> but I wanted to make sure you understood that there are both a claims, a large claims data set we're learning from, as well as the survey. I know we're going to spend most of our time on the survey today. But of all the, of all the slides from the claim study, I thought this was uh, one of the most compelling one that I had not predicted for sure. This shows our large data set. And you can see we're talking 5 million claims per month for uh, behavioral and mental health, for example. And you see how that dwarfs the other clinical topics. So this data set, this data display is looking at just telehealth, stat, telehealth claims. And it's based on ICD-10 uh, codes. Uh, that are in these logical groupings based on, on disease classification and category. Um, and what we see obviously is a, a very low level of telehealth activity in the months uh, prior to uh, February 2020 when the pandemic hit. But it's, it is interesting to see that, that 
mental and behavioral health was above the others as far as the uh, claim frequency. Just to comment that this claims data set is focused on uh, the, the, uh, the uh, private insurance marketplace. So it does not have large numbers of Medicare and Medicaid patients, for example, but it does represent all 50 states and represents over half of all private claims in the country. So that's our, our really uh, great opportunity to work with the Change Healthcare team that they have this huge uh, claims processing uh, window on the world. So remember this when we think about who's benefiting uh, patients, patient-wise, as well as who's participating from a clinician uh, story uh, in telehealth. So, so behavioral health is ahead of the game and is way ahead of the game as far as uh, volume of care being delivered on a day-to-day, -day, moment to -moment, moment basis. But that all specialties were highly impacted and abruptly impacted uh, in, in uh, February, March of last year. Uh, next slide, John. So now we'll just move on to the survey of providers. So this survey uh, included, I think we had uh, 1,594 responses. Uh, we had providers from all different quadrants of the, of the country. We had a good distribution of age groups as far as providers go. Uh, it was 87% physicians and 13% uh, non-physician licensed providers. And so uh, a nice distribution. This particular slide, I think, is a really important story. We, we see that providers are using all types of delivery platforms to do telehealth. Uh, everything from the plain telephone, which we'll refer to here as audio only, uh, to Zoom, which as we know, pre-pandemic was not an allowable platform. But in, during pandemic time, we see 33 to 37% of providers using it to do telehealth. Um, so this is really, I think, an important story and really uh, 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 a call to arms of sorts for what do we do next from a technology perspective. And so this should lead to lots of thinking for our, uh, for our entrepreneurial colleagues who are trying to develop new methods uh, uh, for telehealth delivery. Uh, what was, I think, to some extent uh, disappointing was the relatively uh, small percentage of physicians that said they were using their EHR telehealth module or the telehealth tools that were provided from their EHR, 17 to 18%. Uh, almost every provider here is telling us that they use multiple platforms to do what they need to do. And in my own uh, practice, I'm using not only my EHR-based module, but also using uh, uh, FaceTime quite a bit, as well as Doximity, as well as uh, Zoom on occasion when I need to get a whole family involved in, on a call. So this is uh, something we need to keep our eye on uh, and also ask the question, why do patients choose these platforms and why do providers choose these platforms? So hoping that can be part of our discussion today. Uh, next slide. Um, and then from the perspective of providers, we ask them, what, what are the barriers and challenges that you and your organization are facing when we think about maintaining or expanding telehealth in the months to come. And we provided a long list of possible uh, uh, concepts and most providers selected more than one. And certainly reimbursement leads the way and technology challenges for patients. Um, but I was surprised to see that liability was a concern uh, on such a high percentage of providers in this survey, 33%. So I'm hoping we can um, also be reflecting on these findings when we think about health policy and uh, payer policies going forward. So I think, Jen, that's most of the data I wanted to bring forth, and there's enough there to keep us talking. Uh, but there are you know, another 25 or so questions uh, that you can see explored on the website uh, using the interactive tool. Um, oh, yeah, we did that last one there. Sorry. Uh, is about about uh, sensors and monitoring technology. This again is a, is a is a look over the horizon for where we hopefully will be going with more advanced uh, these more advanced uh, ways of monitoring and, and, and helping patients gather uh, their gathering information about their clinical care. Uh, this shows that physicians 
and providers were using smartphones uh, with the, with cameras, uh, but also blood pressure cuffs and all these other uh, data collection devices. In most cases, patients and doctors were reporting that they were using, say, a plain old thermometer or a plain old scale, and they were just reporting the information through the telehealth uh, visit. So this does not imply that these were uh, uh, you know, automated data dumps or Wi-Fi enabled data collection. Uh, so lots of room to improve and to grow when it comes to the Internet of Things and the data integration for, uh, for telehealth going forward. Um, FX, you were very good to include this one because you know this is one that I've been very <laughs> curious about from the beginning and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about this with this crowd as well. Um, what I'm going to do, so I realized I made a mistake um, and I will rectify it before we post these. So uh, FX, you were kind enough to share your information here in case folks have questions. One of the other things I just want to pick up before we do a, a bit of a round robin of our experts and then throw it open for questions. You made the excellent point. We have, I, I, what I've loved the most about the work we've done together is the sort of the three-pronged approach that we weren't gonna look, um, you know, just um, at the claim data, but we were gonna put that in context with the voice of the, the clinicians actually sort of on the front lines through all of this. And that we also want to hear from the patients. Um, when we post this and when I share this, I will make sure that we add that link to the patient survey. I'm sure everyone on the line has had um, a telehealth encounter over the last year. We want to learn from as many and as many diverse people as possible. So a little plug for that. I'll probably plug it at the end. I'll put it into these slides. Um, and actually any of my colleagues, uh, if you can multitask better than I can and pop it into chat, please do, because that might be a nice way to, to handle it as well. So I promise we do a round robin and I'm watching sort of a couple of questions come in as well. So don't be afraid to use the chat or the Q&A while we're still uh, talking. Um, first of all, Natalie, let's come to you first. Do you want to do a quick intro and then I'll skip ahead to your slides and then come back to Meg? Sure. Why don't you actually start with the slides? Because I think I can introduce myself really efficiently with the first slide. So I'm with uh, Massachusetts Health Quality Partners and we're an independent coalition of key stakeholders in Massachusetts and we're working to improve the quality of patient experience through collaboration. And I think what expertise we add to the group is really we do a lot of qualitative work with clinicians and patients to flesh out some of the quantitative data that the group has found. And um, the slides that I'll be presenting have to do with a series of four very short clinician surveys that have a qualitative and a quantitative component called Together for Better Telehealth. If I could have the next slide, and I'll skip a few of these so we can go quickly to a discussion. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, there were four surveys and each survey built on the other. We asked at the end of each survey what clinicians wanted to learn about in the next survey, and then we used that information to um, derive questions for the next survey. And you'll see here some of the topics that we touched on under each of the waves. And if you want to see results, and there are quite a lot of them, uh, the website is here for you to uh, link to. Next slide, please. And um, as I mentioned, we have a qualitative and a quantitative aspect to our survey. So we asked a question if you agree or disagree with a certain statement or a theme or concept. And then we asked what strategies or techniques people have used to counter it or if they had any suggestions. And so this way we, we could um, you know, answer the why as well. Uh, next slide, please. And here is just an example of health equity. How much do you agree with the following statement? Just to give you a flavor of the kind of data we have. I won't go into it. Next slide, please. And some other comments about condition fatigue, which we found if, if you've been on Zoom a lot, you're probably experiencing it too. Next slide, please. And um, I want to discuss that we sort of um, supplement the information that this group has, has worked together on uh, with some quantitative information. And this is sort of the take home messages of all of the surveys that we've had in the field with clinicians so far. And I just wanted to bring them up so you can keep it in mind when you review or discuss some of the, the quantitative stuff that we'll be discussing today. But basically, clinician experience has wide, varied widely in uh, telehealth during the pandemic. Some of that did really well. Some felt it was very challenging. They really wanted that hands-on um, um, approach. Um, so appreciated that it gave them the opportunity to know their patients better in their homes, see their families. Um, others, not so much. Um, 
some uh, thought it was easier to for patients to access telehealth. It, um, you know, improved access. Some felt it actually exacerbated um, disparities in access. Um, and many felt that there were unexpected benefits reported, you know, engaged patients in different ways, things like that. And then many thought, depending on the visit type, um, it had some serious limitations. So that's with anything, it's always more complicated than you might think. And I think that is my last slide. So thank you very much for um, your attention. Fantastic. And Natalie, it's good to put the findings from the telehealth impact study into some of the deep dive work you've done on sort of um, other questions. And I think that sort of characterized our work together, right, which is how do we sort of think about the implications of this within sort of the broader sort of corpus of evidence that's emerging. Um, I do see a few questions, but I, I, I want to not rush us and I want to make sure you hear from uh, the experts that we have on the line. And so I'll call on each of my colleagues from um, the survey, maybe to offer some reflections on some of the data that um, uh, FX presented. And Meg, I'll come to you first. Would you like me to share your slide? Would that be helpful? Yeah, that would be great. And honestly, it's more of even an appendix slide for people to be able to to um, access some of the resources and research that we've done as well. But first I would just echo <clears throat> all of the insights that Natalie was just sharing. Um, we've heard very similar things, obviously not only from this COVID-19 um, coalition survey, but also from some initiatives that we've done helping to roll out telehealth with practices across the country um, and a mix of different practices, small practices and from larger health systems. And we've heard very similar themes. One key insight I, I think is very important to stress from the coalition survey, that telehealth impact survey that we did, is that 68% of physicians noted that they are motivated to continue, if not increase, the amount of telehealth that they are doing in their practices. I think we've touched on some of the barriers um, that need to be addressed to ensure that this can sustain, because I think at a high level, we've proven that widespread feasibility is is doable, right, for telehealth. Um, I think now with a focus on optimization and optimization for how best to balance in-person care with virtual care and figuring out kind of the secret sauce for that is where all eyes are on for 2021 and beyond. Um, but the interest is there, right, largely both from physicians and definitely from patients from all of the research that we are seeing. So really then it's how do we tackle some of these key, again, issues or barriers that have surfaced. And I think largely with recognition that the majority of physicians, the first time they were using telehealth was in March or April or spring of this year, right? So to that end, there's no shortage of training and education opportunities um, that need to be you know, rolled out. And I think everyone is, again, working to figure out the best way to do so. I think the workforce or the workflow optimization piece of that is critical because we've heard in both the research and qualitatively that most people have been in survival mode, standing up different platform options and working with different vendors um, and that there's not a lot of integration with the EHR right now, which of course complicates some things from a workflow perspective that has to be addressed. Um, the fair reimbursement piece just also has to continue for this to sustain, which um, AMA and I know others are strongly working on to ensure that access um, remains in place. And also audio only access right now remains in place. And I think that really speaks to the health equity piece of this, that at least for the short term, we have to have that be able to be in place so that there's a large um, access ability. This slide um, really just speaks to some of the resources that AMA has uh, put out, and these are all mission-driven and freely avail available to the community. We've got uh, some playbooks that are actually step-by-step -step resource guides based on insights that we have aggregated that are available on our website, as well as a telehealth quick guide that you can think of as more so cliff notes for all key questions or commonly asked questions that we get um, related to payment, policy and really uh, the implementation and uh, optimization pieces for this. So let me stop there, but um, you know, no shortage of barriers to tackle, but I think that the potential is massive. And last thing I'll say is even for remote patient monitoring, you know, we touched on some of the new modalities or new solution types that people are using. 
But again, we learned from the COVID-19 coalition survey that only 11% of physicians are using remote patient monitoring right now. So as we think of the you know, market opportunity for that and the ability for that to scale, that's massive you know, into 2021 and beyond. Um, fantastic. Uh, Meg, this will be uh, shared with all the others. So the, the suite of resources you have is terrific. And a lot of folks on the line will know that um, Dime's done some work um, on digital clinical measures. And we didn't even dive that deep into some of the clinical pieces. And we referenced your um, RPM playbook because it's an incredible resource. So highly recommend it's referenced in the Dime playbook and highly, highly recommend taking a look at the RPM and telehealth playbooks if you haven't seen that. Um, I'll continue to try and get some reactions to this data to give it some context for our conversation. And Laurie, I wonder if I can come to you next. Certainly, if I can get myself off of mute. So, you know, I think uh, obviously from the AMA's perspective, um, you know, it just advance. Uh, talking a little bit more, adding to what Meg shared. You know, we frequently, from a digital perspective, as we look at digital solutions, look at things uh, using kind of four lenses from a physician. Um, will I get paid? Will I get sued? Uh, does it work? And will it work within my workflow? And we often look at that as, as how a physician really looks at di these digital solutions. And the feedback that we got from the survey really supported exactly kind of those things. They are concerned about, will they continue to get paid? What does continuing reimbursement look like? The integration, but you know, in their work for, uh, their workflow, um, it, you know, the liability question that was much higher than I think we expected is certainly on their minds. And you, if you marry that with the credentialing, um, you know, cross state initiatives and discussions that are going on, I, I think it would be in some ways, it would be very um, intuitive as to what we'd expect to see, which I think is actually very promising because it means that there's a path forward, a very logical path forward for us to evaluate and adopt and make progress on what is a very important um, pivot in healthcare that is not going to go away. And uh, you know, a statistic that I, I, is not related to the survey, but I think is interesting uh, on the AMA's website, uh, at the end of 2019, our average number of searches around telehealth was about 18,000 a month. And closing out 2020, um, we're in excess of 110,000 searches per month. So, it, you know, in all facets, uh, digital health, telehealth is here to stay and, and increasing with tremendous opportunity. Um, as Meg mentioned, while we only saw 11-ish percent uh, of physicians using remote patient monitoring, I think that something like 80% of those were still actually not using a connected device. They were inputting the data. So an opportunity and you know, a point of failure for us as well, or a potential point of failure. So some, um, you know, some great promise of opportunity, uh, particularly when you see the level of investment going into this space. And as you watch the market merge and migrate and pivot back and forth and all the shifts going on. Clearly an exciting time um, with opportunity to have an impact. And maybe not so different than, the, than what some of us are feeling around what COVID has brought. Um, I mean, telemedicine is, is in some ways very akin to the fact that we all do business now on Zoom and Teams. And, you know, we have, we have Zoom fatigue. You hear about you know, we have, you have physician fatigue, you have Zoom fatigue. Um, is it, you know, right, that's right. Um, how, many, how many hours are we, you know, all on these computers? And then, you know, the exacerbation around health inequity, which is really not just in healthcare. Um, it, it's really, you know, uh, across the nation right now. So um, some great research and, and trends for us to act on. Fantastic. Laurie, those are really insightful remarks, and I'll pick up on those with some of the questions that are coming in. Jeff, I wonder if we can come to you next, though, as you sort of reflect on all of this. Where, what's your take? Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting uh, convergence of factors that you can actually find answers to within claims, right? So I, as I look at the survey results, and I've worked with this team 
there's a couple of real factors. One is technology adoption, right? And, and you know that the best technology dissolves into a workflow, right? And every time you get a new upgrade of uh, Outlook or whatever email tool you use, you lose your mind because you can't find that little button that you're used to finding, right? So there's gonna be some adoption effects going on, but I think that claims give you a deeper aspect or a deeper understanding of that sort of technology adoption effect. And here's why, right? Claims are a transactional snapshot, not only of an event that occurred, but what services were offered within it, right? And within the context of telemedicine, there's a big question. Is a primary care provider able to deliver all the services needed within a telemedicine visit, right? Can they get the stethoscope out and do a pulse oximeter read? There's a lot of devices that fit within a telemedicine platform that can actually do those kind of things, right? We can actually look within claims to get a sense of what procedures are being performed to see how telemedicine works within a standard care delivery and a diagnostic assessment, right? So when I say use claims to do that, the great thing is, we're talking about millions of claims every year, right? And as such, you may get uh, some normalization steps you need to take, but directionally, you're getting really robust answers around what's being done, how it's being done. And I think the other aspect of this too that's gonna be important is the staying power, right? Claims are all about billing and reimbursement, and I'm gonna abstract away, away from that for a second. So look at this notion or concept of liability and how it relates within claims, right? If you can look at a provider or a panel or a population and look at a wide and diverse and understandable claim pool, you can see what telemedicine utilization is looking like, right? So is a patient receiving telemedicine visits once a month, twice a month, what are the outcomes? What are the supplementary care processes going along with telemedicine, right? Think about it this way. Telemedicine becomes a, a way to triage patients potentially, right? To indicate whether they need more intense care or not. Or it could be a way given the appropriate, as I said, oximeter reads or stethoscope reads. If you have those devices built into a telemedicine platform, you can actually do a lot of frontline care and not just triage, right? So there's a lot of angles around this. And then the final point is claims can give you a good sense about some of the inequities that may be being built into this based on incentives, right? Because telemedicine is two way. You need a, a good telemedicine platform or a, a venue where people can go where they can get access to that care, right? Claims can give you the ability to triangulate on geography, on physician taxonomy or specialty, and also on patient attributes to some degree as well, because on claims, you have limited demographic info. You put all this together and what I'm really driving at is I think claims can give you a really robust way to identify a truth set. And I think that's what FX has really been working on as he's looked at claims and he's looked at utilization around it. And uh, it's gonna be really exciting in the next couple of weeks and months as we deepen and continue our research around these themes. Fantastic, Jeff. I loved how you tied a few pieces together there. And I think that's exactly right. Looking, you know, it's it's not just the top level um, sort of data we need to be looking at. We really need to dive in and sort of be thoughtful to position this whole sort of new field, if we want to call that, call it that. I'm not sure if we should. That could be a topic for discussion of telehealth. Um, Nick, from the innovators perspective, how do you read all of this? What's in the tea leaves? Uh, definitely being able to get uh, your unmute uh, clicked faster is going to be really important uh, in, in the future of, of virtual based care. I, I think the thing that that's been kind of the most fascinating is, is sort of seeing uh, what our entrepreneurs have been telling us for years play out in the data. Um, and they're like, well, this service, we know it's needed, but it's not covered today. Or um, we know that uh, you know, physicians are willing to make the switch if they if the incentives are there, um, and and I think you're seeing, uh, and, and Meg called this out earlier when we think about sort of health equity, we think about a rural community or we think about people that don't have access to broadband internet, 
and, and don't have access to specialists, how do they receive special, you know, specialty care? Um, you know, how do we enable that? So, you know, telehealth isn't exclusively Zoom, even though there's a lot of people that are using Zoom, um, but really, you know, allowing people to receive care where they are. Um, and, and I am really anxious to see how uh, remote patient monitoring is going to play into this uh, future sort of care paradigm. And there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are well positioned um, to, to support that. So um, a lot of the sort of M health and then digital health has been built around uh, sort of the concept of value-based care. And so uh, if we continue to move in that kind of value-based care um, directive uh, where you're, you're caring, you know, for people where they are, not necessarily in a sort of purely reactive or acute sense. Um, I, I think that you're going to see, uh, you're going to see, you know, continued explosion of, of digital health in a good way. Um, so what's, what's, you know, what's been really curious or interesting to, to learn about um, is just thinking about what happens post pandemic, what stays, what continues to advance. Um, and I think the work that the AMA is doing, uh, the ATA are doing, um, that this group is doing, um, is helping lay some of that foundational work. And so this is something that we encourage all of our entrepreneurs to take a look at, um, is what, what's the underlying incentive structure? Um, because you're not gonna be able to build a business uh, without that. Um, and, uh, you know, as harsh as that sounds. Uh, so. That, that's something that I think is really important. At, and this specific point in time is that we're aligning incentives towards what we want this healthcare experience to be like in this country. Um, so we had to react pretty quickly to what's going on with COVID-19. But now that we've reacted, there's some concrete that's starting to become solid. Um, so we have a pretty limited amount of time, um, I'd expect, to to really make sure that this foundation is solid. Um, and so looking at the survey data to say, okay, what's, um, what barriers are in the way? Um, you know, what are patients flocking towards? What are providers worried about? What are they flocking towards? What kind of modalities you know, are working or not working? Um, these are all really important things as we start to you know, figure out what this future is gonna be. Um, so, uh, this work has been fantastic for our companies. Um, they've gotten a lot of investment because of this kind of data, um, because you know, for the first time um, in a while, the path forward is a lot clearer. Um, and we heard this over and over again that five-year plans were being executed in five days. Um, and that was very true at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, I don't see us going backwards because you know, there were 18,000 people a month going on to the AMA website learning about telehealth, you know, that we were headed in this direction. Um, so this isn't a, you know, purely reactionary stance. This is a rapid execution of what the future was going to be anyways. Um, so, uh, you know, th those are some of the things that I take away from this. Nick, that was a really lovely summation. Um, and news that will surprise exactly no one, I have some thoughts on all of this, but there's a couple of people um, I want to call on if I can. Um, and uh, guys, if I'm putting you in an awkward situation, you can't talk where you are, that's fine, just pop it in the chat. But I wanted to, um, I wanted to come to you, Ben, um, if I can. If I think about you as sort of a tech entrepreneur, as someone who is developing a resource of sort of tech products, What's your sort of take on all of these findings? How do you think about overcoming some of these challenges of sort of integration and trust? And Ben, if you were listening to the question before you decided whether you could answer or not, that's also fine. <laughs> Pick me if you can't, but I'm always fine with a, with a second to come off on mute if you can, uh, if you want to give that some voice. Okay, fantastic. I don't want to put anyone under, well, I'm going to put someone else on the spot for a second if I can. David, um, Dan Sero, I also know that um, you're on the line and you and I have had an awful lot of conversations around this. Um, you have been sort of practicing uh, telehealth as a physical therapist throughout the, the crisis and it's been a rough ride. Do you want to share a little bit about how you interpret some of these findings? Are you somewhere where you can chat? Yeah, <laughs> excuse me all. Yeah, and um, uh, can, you, can you hear me okay? We've got you, David. 
Okay, so I uh, I am not going to come on come on camera because I've <laughs> I welcomed a new puppy into the home in the last uh, seventy two hours, so you don't want to see me on camera. But yeah, I did. Um, I would love to share. Um, first of all, I'm one of the lucky enough that as a rehab a physical therapist, been one of the probably two percent of all PTs that have been doing telehealth telemedicine prior to the pandemic. And I've been doing it exclusively since March with a lot of trials and tribulations. And, and, and one of the main things is that I, to, to, you know, looking at the survey is seeing that this very small percentage of um, actually coordinated platforms that are being used. And I think that the data showed that only something like 10% um, were using, a, a, you know, a coordinated system. And that goes to um, you know, really, um, especially in what I do, I pr prescribe exercise uh, as medicine. So, um, and with that, and also the ability to connect remotely monitoring tools, and I think one of the other slides showed that something of all the vitals that are being measured, um, less than 10% of activity uh, uh, mobility data is actually coming back to uh, myself as, as a person practitioner. And that's a big barrier because in, in PT, um, having that before the first appointment could certainly um, really make my the patient's experience so much more efficient. It goes to that whole, you know, when the, we talk about the playbook and the data that's under the, under the curve or under that iceberg, um, you know, projecting fall risk and really being able to move the needle on, on better outcomes. Um, so I see, you know, it the long and short of it all comes down to reimbursement because many of the rehab providers that aren't um, adopting this tool in their toolbox are very concerned that down the road, you know, this is all going to go away. So that's, that's part of the barrier. So those who are, you know, innovating in that space, um, I think PT and rehab professionals could have a big, big part in this, but we need the systems and, and the, the, to be able to integrate that whole I guess Tower of Babel, they call it, or what, whatever you, however you want it, the interoperability is just certainly not there and something we need to work on. Um, David, those are such important insights and thank you. Um, you're very gracious as I put you on the spot. Nick, I'm gonna come to you because I know you want to riff on that. And then Ben, um, I, I know that you're back able to speak. So I will uh, I wanna hear from your perspective in a second. Nick, go ahead. Real quick, I, I bet that um, my perspective on this is way limited to, to what uh, the rest of the folks on the call are, are hearing. Um, during the sort of early days of the pandemic, we brought together um, a few health systems, a few payers, um, the AMA and a few other organizations to have a conversation about, you know, what, what the hell's going on and how do we, how do we figure this out? And uh, one of the things that we, we kept hearing, um, it was interesting to watch this live where the health systems were saying, we're, under, we're overwhelmed. We don't know what's coming next. And we can't make capital investments if we don't know where the future incentive model is going to be. We're not going to invest a lot in telehealth platforms if we're not going to get reimbursed for telehealth after this pandemic's over. Health plans, we need you to confirm that you're going to continue to cover at these rates. And then the health plans would say, well, you know, we're, we're waiting to see what the government is going to say. And then the government saying, well, we're waiting to see what you're all going to do. And so it was really interesting to watch like sort of CMS and the state people talking with, you just see that we're stuck. Um, and so, uh, you know, hopefully this kind of work uh, gets to show that off. But I, I think one of the answers is we need to call our Congress people <laughs> and let them know that, you know, this is, this is important um, uh, if you want to continue to see um, this kind of coverage and create that kind of clarity. Um, that's a terrific, Meg, I see you, if I can, I'm going to go to Ben real quick and then I'm going to come back to you, Meg. So Ben, uh, to, to wildly put you on your on the spot and thanks for being a good Sorry sport. About that. No, no, no worries. You have a really sort of high quality evidence-based sort of uh, a, a couple of digital tools in the toolbox. And what we've heard and what we saw in the data was, you know, they're not friendly for integration. Are we going to invest in them? As a tech innovator, how do you position yourself through all of this? So specifically in this context, and let me just give you one example that I think will touch upon uh, some of the things that were already mentioned. This is going to be a bit more Europe-centric than US-centric. Uh, so so I, I work for Vitalize and we're primarily, we're based out of Belgium. We have an office in the US. But in this whole COVID thing, we, uh, 
we, uh, of course, like everybody else here, we heard from a lot of people, specifically healthcare providers, that they were lacking uh, these tools. And they all did, were on board with the idea of considering the current crisis, we need a way to monitor people in their home environment, especially when they get uh, discharged from the hospital, potentially a little bit earlier than we otherwise would discharge them so that we can free up beds for people that really need it. And so we banded together in Belgium with a couple of other uh, partners, uh, uh, primarily healthcare uh, partners, to very quickly, and I'm not, I mean, okay, that's gonna sound like a brag because I, I work for the company, but in a, in a matter of a month, we basically put together a very simplistic and but pragmatic solution. We weren't even using our own devices, which are these patches that are relatively complicated to use. And a lot of healthcare providers were seeing the potential but hesitant to commit to using a technology like that. But we grabbed the thermometer and an SPO2 uh, clip uh, just off the shelf and we built an app around it that would allow hospitals to centralize in a centralized way, look at all the data that came in from the patient using it at home and had a patient app that did nothing more than conduit that data from those two very simple devices back to that dashboard. And in, in a month's time, we had about half of the hospitals in, in Flanders on board in that. Uh, it's a very simplistic system. It's not going to make a huge impact right now, but that has really given us the opportunity to now go in with more advanced sensors, which we are currently doing. Now, the main point I wanted to make, and I think, um, I hope that will be the, the thing that is of, of interest in, in this conversation, is that the Belgium is a single payer healthcare system, uh, and the uh, federal office uh, involved with reimbursement has actually uh, set up a pilot study, which means that there is now a first step towards reimbursement for this kind of tools. So right now there are hospitals in uh, Belgium who are submitting applications that will go live next week that will allow hospitals to use these kinds of tools and get reimbursed. And reimbursed doesn't mean just for using a device. It is on the level of uh, home care that might be involved uh, with uh, telemonitoring teams that are maybe outsourced from different hospitals, the use of the devices, the use of the platform, and of course, uh, the time of the physicians. So all of these things are kind of falling into place in a very rapid uh, pace. And it's uh, it's something that was really interesting for us to see this happening, that this momentum that everybody talks about that's happening because of COVID is actually happening also on a federal level in a country like Belgium. Um, ben, thank you. You're a good sport when I put you on the spot. And that's a terrific example, actually, to think about how we can be sort of fit for purpose, not just light on our feet now during the crisis, but thinking ahead. It's phenomenal. Meg, um, I did cut you off for a second, so I want to come back to you and thank oh you God. for your patience. <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to riff off of what Nick was saying, because I think it's spot on. I mean, I, I really think we're in this kind of chicken and egg scenario right now that um, everyone is kind of looking to different stakeholder groups to paint a picture for what does the value of virtual care and virtual health look like, um, especially as we're attempting to illustrate or again, um, depict what this future of hybrid and in-person care can be and how can we best optimize that. To that end, AMA, we've initiated some research that really is focused on how do we move beyond just the financial outcomes and the ROI aspects of virtual care that obviously is imperative and we have to have that, but We've termed this return on health research specific to virtual care. And to that point, we're really, what we've done so far is we've interviewed 15 plus leading organizations from different practice settings. So think like a large system with an integrated plan, like a Kaiser, a large system that is fee for service right now, smaller practice environments and some of the direct to consumer um, of the world, like the Teladocs and the Walmarts, et cetera, to see a how they are outlining their virtual care strategies today, how they are approaching that in the short term and how they're thinking about that bigger picture, right? And how they're weighting the different value streams based on the environmental variables being their payment arrangements, their clinical, um, uh, clinical use cases that they have, their patient mixes, et cetera. So value streams being, again, beyond dollars and cents, but around patient access around health equity, around patient and physician experience, and last but not least, clinical outcomes, right? Of like how you're opening up for higher acuity pace um, situations based on be, having telehealth and virtual care being part of that mix. So we will have um, an initial summary from all of that work completed by the end of Q1. 
that we'd love to share out like with this group more broadly. And if we're taking a very collaborative approach for this as we attempt to do always. And so if there's anyone interested from this club and from this group in helping contribute to that or collaborating on this work, please reach out, I'd love to connect. Fantastic. We've got some strong calls to action here. We've got return to health. We've got for your congressperson. Um, I love it. There are th there are tasks to do. We can actually make a difference here. Um, Jim, I'm going to come to you. You've you've had your your hand raised, and then Laurie, I'll come back to you after we've answered Jim's question. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if the panel could just comment on the on the behavioral and mental health portion of this. So we've talked about the obstacles with uh, other conditions where you may not have the right RPM instruments, but it seems like for most, most uh, behavioral and mental health, it's a conversation. And while there's some people that aren't covered, just about everybody has a cell phone. Okay, it's a, you know, it's, 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 so it seems like that's the path of least resistance. So if you were to look at that from today, there's still obstacles. What do you guys see are the obstacles in that use case, which seems to have less, less obstacles than some of the other ones? Yeah, Jen, I'll, I'll take a shot at that as an initial pass. I, I think that's a, a very insightful comment because when you look at the claim volumes, those assessments are exactly where you see a lot of telemedicine utilization occurring in this age of COVID, right? And, and that speaks to the idea that people were used to it, right? So it's just a question of adoption into a wider category of, say, patient pools or services, right? But uh, same people. Um, what I would say is uh, kind of related to what we've talked about in terms of ROI and incentive is that we need to be a little bit less maybe ambitious and talk about neutrality, right, as opposed to optimality, right? And what I mean by neutrality is neutrality in outcome and neutrality in cost, right? Because let's assume that an ENM code face-to-face -face is going to have a higher reimbursement, but uh, a telemedicine ENM code may be able to be performed, uh, you know, twice a week or twice a month as opposed to once a month. So from that perspective, if you can think about providing uh, care without complication or with minimized complications in conjunction with uh, a delivery method that is easy and a cost method which is palatable to the payer side, the payers are going to be driving a lot of these decisions. I think that's going to go a long way towards expanding adoption, not only within psych assessment and other areas as well. Um, I'll let others make uh, deeper comments than that. Jeff, that was a really terrific answer. FX, go ahead. I'm going to give something. Then we're going to go to Laurie. Then I'm going to let you all go on time. FX, you have the floor. Sure. <laughs> uh, I would say that I'm an advocate for what, what you would refer to as telehealth first, meaning for almost every clinical discipline that we should be thinking about telehealth as the first and the most accessible form of care for patients. And if we keep thinking about it, what, what's best for the patient as opposed to what's possible for the provider, I think it'll lead us to a clear path. And I think mental health has already voted with its feet and told us that it's what patients want. And it's also driven by constraints of supply. So it's the poster child for, for I think, a successful uh, direction for telehealth. Uh, but I think with every other specialty, the ideas of uh, rapid triage and helping the patient know, do they need to get further into the healthcare system or what's right for them that day or that week uh, is key. And then the chronic disease management. We look at the, the two big burdens in our healthcare system. One is access on the front end and the other is managing chronic illness. So telehealth first from the patient's perspective, I think should drive us in the right direction. And I advocate for, you know, kind of a, a liberal version of uh, payer responsibilities and government payer responsibilities over this next 18 months while we continue this experiment, because we are still in an experimental phase. I think there'll be plenty of time to start to cut back or reprice things out once we know, you know, where, where can we get to with a combination of provider innovation and, uh, and patient uh, acceptance. Over. I love that FX and I'm going to riff on it real quick and then Laurie give you uh, the, the mic for some closing comments. I would love us to experiment with the idea of relinquishing our obsession with the visit. Um, and what I mean by that is everything we've done as we've moved to telehealth is still trying to recon like reconstitute what we do 
in a traditional setting where you have a timed visit. And if we look at some of the data we have, not only are we making poor use of things like remote patient monitoring, but I think 40% of the time when they were used, they were only reviewed in snapshot just before the visit, just like they would be on a chart as you walked into the room. And I think about the dashboard that you mentioned, Ben, and all of the many other innovations, how do we actually start to reimagine care? So it's not these snapshot visions, but we actually think about sort of building out care around the patient. We think about um, not uh, just trying to copy and paste what we've done in the clinic, but using new approaches based on the full toolkit we have now. I'd love to see that as part of the experimentation. Um, Jim, hopefully we're giving you some good answers and Laurie, I'll let you give some laugh remarks here as you've been very patient, thank you. Oh, thank you, I, I, I will be uh, concise. And I just I was, wanted to riff a little bit on the collaboration theme because one of the things that I think comes out um, that is put, it's put squarely on the table is the collaboration between the payer and the provider community in that, um, and, and these independent telemedicine organizations because the goals and objectives are not all aligned. And so when the payer engages an independent telemedicine company to perform those services, it by almost by definition can disintermediate the patient um, from an EHR perspective. And so um, understanding how to align all of, all of the people around, as FX said, the patient and what's best for the patient um, will, you know, enable everyone to be successful, I think, but remains squarely in the center of what we need to do moving forward. With that, I will turn it back over to you. Um, crikey, this was phenomenal. I would like to thank everyone who joined and offered terrific remarks and questions. This was a phenomenal conversation, and I want to thank um, all of my uh, expert colleagues from the Telehealth Impact Study Workgroup. Also, we've only scratched the surface for some of the data we've collected. So go ahead, dive in. Um, we've also shared some other resources with you and we will add the link to participate. So in fact, that's three calls to action. If you've had a telehealth visit, complete the survey, we'll send you the link, call your congressperson and check out um, a lot of the AMA resources that are going on. So it's always nice to be able to uh, make some forward progress after this. Very, very briefly before I let you all go, um, I, we whiz through this real quick, I'm sorry. Um, we have a couple of other events coming up. We are hosting our Rock Health colleagues um, on Thursday to review the findings from their diversity and digital health um, survey from last year. And our next journal club, we will be hosting Eric Paraxlis um, from Duke. Um, he ha has just published a piece, in, a piece in JAMA, Digital Health, the Need to Assess Benefits, Risks and Value. So there's definitely a theme to uh, our early spring programming. Uh, Meg, FX, Natalie, Jeff, Nick, Laurie, thank you so much for joining us um, and have a wonderful day, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Jan. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.